Well, thank you uh, for being here. Uh, I've just had a, a, just a 30 minutes or so to look over the uh, material, so some of my statements will be broad. Uh, in the end, uh, this is where it be becomes real. The governor puts out his budget, we get the February forecast, uh, and then we continue to move forward to the end. Uh, I, I know the governor mentioned being on the campaign trail and, and uh, this is what the people wanted. Uh, first of all, I don't think that's true. Otherwise, when we won the special election recently by significant numbers, now they want what we want. Uh, but in the end, uh, he made a number of promises and uh, this first budget is the kind of budget you get when you promise everyone everything. Uh, there are so many things in there that it's hard to even uh, fathom how much is there. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything the governor did say no to. I, I'm interested in that, but I don't, I don't see anything in there. This uncontrolled spending will give, give Minnesota the, rep, the reputation of being cold California. And if we're not careful, we will move to the position of number one tax state in the union, which is not something that I, that I will allow. Uh, it was our goal to try to get out of the top five. With Governor Dayton, we could not do that, but I certainly don't want to be aiming towards number one. Uh, we'll continue to work to get out of the top five and eventually out of the top 10. Uh, I don't want to be a low tax state, but we should not be a high tax state. So there's four things that I want to address here that I'm concerned about, uh, and then uh, we'll let the Kurt Dowd also speak uh, on his behalf. But number one, almost doubling the gas tax and then adding a tab fee increase and sales tax increase on auto, on, uh, auto sales is remarkable. Even just the gas tax is about $300 per family every year of a new tax. Government run health care for all is a recipe for disaster in rural Minnesota for rural health care, and I frank, frankly think across the state, but a disaster that we'll have to talk more about. Continuing the sick tax, the 2% sick tax, I just want to say is a dead issue. We agreed in 2011 that that was going to go away. Uh, we need to be, should have been planning for that. Uh, we have to plan now. And finally, there were no real reforms to control the rise in spending, no real address of waste, fraud, and abuse. And if we hadn't grown 39% in our budget over the last eight years, maybe we'd have a different argument. But 39% in the last eight years, and if you factor in inflation and you factor in the population growth, there's still a large number above that that we're growing. And I don't want to be the one that says we have to live within our means, but frankly, whether you're an individual, whether you're a, a business, no matter who you are, you have to figure out how to live within your means. And this does not do that. I, we, if I, my calculations are correct, it's a 9% spending increase over the next biennium. My Commissioner Franz talked about fiscally sound budget is our starting point, which I agree with but it also needs to be our finishing point. And if we're in an economic downturn, which we don't know yet, but January numbers were significantly down, if people think that we're moving in a downward trend, the last thing you wanna do is have huge spending increases that continue to be ongoing after that, because revenues then shrink and you're in an even more difficult position. Last thing I'll say that I, I see that it, it looks like it's a $3.6 billion tax increase, and we'll have to confirm that, but I see $1.2 billion of general tax increase, general revenue increase. I'm not sure where that's coming from. I do know that that does not include the provider tax, which I think is $1.2 billion, and the gas tax, which is like $1.2 billion. So that's where... Again, I just saw this, so the, those numbers are where I think it's going to be, and that's just not the direction we need to be going. So I'll do my best to look at things that we can agree on. Uh, there were many things in there that I, I believe we'll find, but these big overriding principles, uh, 
I think will get us into trouble if we don't pay attention to them. Tax increase and spending growth are two that we have to pay attention to. All right, good afternoon. Um, I think we, I literally have just been absorbing what the budget was uh, as I'm sitting here. So uh, some of it, my jaw was hitting the floor as I was hearing some of the things that uh, I was hearing. Um, you know, I think uh, I'm reminded a bit of the fact that Governor Dayton proposed a similar tax increase uh, back in, in 2011, uh, three point some billion dollars. The difference between 2011 and now is that in 2011 we have five billion dollar deficit and right now we have a $1.5 billion surplus. So I, I, I'm interested in, in why we think we have to raise taxes on Minnesotans when we're already collecting more than we need. Uh, this will make Minnesota absolutely uncompetitive. Uh, this is not one Minnesota, this is one expensive Minnesota. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, we're, you saw the editorials over the weekend, you see what's happening in New York State. We are going to tax people out of this state. I remember for years Governor Dayton saying we didn't want to be an outlier. Um, this will make us, I mean, we already are an outlier. This will make us uh, far more of an outlier. Um, and we're seeing what's happening in other high tax states right now. So, um, you know, putting $3.6 billion of additional uh, tax burden onto to Minnesota families uh, right now is not the move that we should be taking. Um, that will turn our economy around and, and definitely send us into a deficit. There's no question uh, that we would be headed for deficit under this plan. So um, those are just some quick thoughts. Gas tax, uh, you know, uh, I can see why the governor is proposing a gas tax because he's taking the money that we put into roads and bridges over the last two years and using it for other things. So uh, the governor is not raising gas tax to put money into roads and bridges here. He's actually raising the gas tax to put money into the general fund. Uh, that's the, 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 the mechanics of what's happening in his budget. Um, the good news is I think everybody wants to fund roads and bridges. Uh, we agree with that. We want to put more money into roads and bridges. Um, now let's talk about how to do that in a way that's sustainable. Um, the gas tax is the problem. Uh, there are declining revenues in the gas tax projected into the future. Uh, therefore, the gas tax shouldn't be the solution. Um, I think we can find another solution with actually growing revenues into the future. Um, so, uh, you know, we certainly are willing to roll up our sleeves. I appreciate the governor gave me a call uh, uh, this morning and kind of gave me a, a heads up on some of the things that he was doing, appreciated that. And I let him know that we want to be part of the solution. Uh, the, the, the problems that face Minnesotans are not partisan. Um, Minnesotans want uh, lower health care costs. They want lower health insurance costs. They want money spent on roads and bridges. They want us to close the achievement gap. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of, you know, looking at the, the huge increase in health care costs that are, that are contained within the budget. Uh, it's a pretty simple statement, but you don't lower health care costs by increasing health care costs. Sounds stupid, doesn't it? I'm going to repeat it 50 times between now and the end of session. You don't lower health care costs by increasing health care costs. Those are broken promises from the campaign trail, not just uh, by our governor, but by uh, all of the legislators uh, who right now are, are in the majority in the House. They all ran on lowering health care costs. Um, and this is a huge increase in health care costs. I'll also notice that the Minnesota Care for All isn't included in, the, in this budget. Uh, it looks like it's out in the tails. Um, and I have a, a, a sneaking suspicion, um, I, I assume we all know why it's in the tails. Um, you can't afford it. Um, and if you put it into this budget, uh, there's no way to pay for it. Um, what we need to make sure is that we give Minnesotans affordable health care. That's what Minnesota families want. We know that. They've told us that. Um, let's figure out how to do that. And we can do it together. That's not a partisan issue. So with that, I think we'll take some questions. Is it that he proposed any increases in these uh, things or, or extension of these taxes, or is it the scale of the things that you're, you're objecting to? Are you talking about the tax increases? Tax increases and the spending increases. And yeah, well, uh, and if you could speak a little louder, that would be helpful for me. But uh, when we have a $1.5 billion surplus and we have roughly $2 billion in reserves, uh, the place to look for covering the things that we all think are important is not more tax increases. So it's zero gas tax increase, it's zero sick tax. I, I'm not sure yet about the tax conformity. It's, it's a fairly complicated uh, bill as far as where it raises revenue, so I have to take a look at that much deeper. So wasn't this 
4.10 for session. Does this look awfully difficult to get a budget done based on the revenue sources in particular? Every budget in divided government is difficult uh, because we uh, come from two very different points of view and at the very end we have to come together and figure it out. Uh, I don't know that this feels any different than any of the other ones. Uh, we are communicating. I think that's important. Uh, there is a, a level of respect between the leaders. I think that that is important. Uh, but the fact uh, that we're far apart, where one group wants to significantly raise taxes and significantly increase spending, and the other group, our group, wants to live within the resources that we have, which is uh, $1.5 billion more, uh, that always is difficult. Senator, were you surprised by the 20 cent gas tax increase plus indexing for inflation for years after that? I was surprised by the combination of gas tax with inflator, with tab fee increase, with uh, increase in sales tax when you're purchasing the vehicle, if I saw it right. The combination of all of them was remarkable. And keep in mind the last two years uh, when uh, uh, Kurt Dowd and I were the leader of the House and Senate, we had a plan. We took half of the sales tax on auto parts. That has happened, is going towards roads and bridges. And we, and we earmarked in the last two years roughly $500 million towards roads and bridges, which we intended to keep doing. We also would have supported and wanted to pass a constitutional amendment that took all of the sales tax on auto parts. It just didn't do it as an increase. So, but there is new money from two years ago. And uh, like uh, Representative Dowd said, uh, I believe, if, if I'm correct, the, the sales tax on the auto parts is going back into the general fund, but then you have those three new sources. On yep. the gas tax really quick. Uh, you know, and, and, and I know you've, you've heard me say this numerous times, but we haven't talked very seriously about the gas tax in a few years. Um, the gas tax is one of the most regressive taxes you can put in place. It, it, it hurts low-income people uh, much more uh, than high-income people. Um, and, and it's also something that hurts greater Minnesota much more than it hurts the metro. Uh, folks in, in my district, for instance, I live an hour north of the Twin Cities. Uh, most of the people in my district commute into the North Metro, um, and they spend a large amount of money on gas as part of their normal budget. And I remember a time when the uh, housing uh, market downturn and, and the economy, the economic downturn of 2008, there was a time period where we went from having $2 a gallon gas to $4 a gallon gas. And that coupled with the, uh, the economic downturn uh, meant that people in my district lost their homes because of the price of gasoline. Um, so there, there are a large number of people in this state um, that are very sensitive, and that's why, you know, people want roads and bridges funded, and I think we can roll up our sleeves and figure out how to fund roads and bridges, uh, but I think we can do that in a way that doesn't hurt low-income Minnesotans. It doesn't hurt uh, folks out in greater Minnesota, um, and I think we need to look for those solutions. I think Minnesotans expect us to do that. On the campaign trail for two years, he says accurately, voters knew what they what he was saying. He got more votes than any other governor elected in Minnesota history. So what's the surprise here? I mean, people want this, don't they? I don't know that there's any surprise, but when and, and when you poll Minnesotans on do you want money invested in a road and bridge infrastructure, it polls in the 70 percent plus range. But when you ask them, do you want the gas tax increased, it polls in what the 30 percent range. Um, the reality is Minnesotans don't want to pay more. They know that we have a surplus in our, in our budget right now, and they know that roads and bridges is a core function of state government. So it, it's a disconnect when we think we can't take money that they already gave us too much and use that for something that is a basic core function of state government. Um, I, I think there's just a disconnect there. I think, in fact, the uh, voters or, or Minnesotans do support a gas tax hike uh, by six out of 10 Minnesotans, according to the campaign polls that were done. You put a poll in the field on a 20 cent per gallon gas tax, and let's see what the results show. <laughs> I think you're going to see that Minnesotans are going to say, wow, uh, that's an extreme approach to solving a problem. Sure. And, and, uh, and, and you also have to raise a gas tax that high. Uh, when you're taking money that we have already in the last two years put into road and bridge infrastructure and taking that out to spend on other things. So he's backfilling. That's why I say this gas tax money isn't even for roads and bridges. Um, it's for uh, waste, fraud, and abuse at DHS that, that people refuse to go and, and look for. Um, we can do better with the, with the tax dollars that are already entrusted to us, um, but this gas tax isn't for roads and bridges. It's for backfilling into the general fund. 
Well, I'll yeah, just briefly address that. If that's true, then it's also true that they've changed their mind because uh, Senator Jason Rarick said he would not support a gas tax and won overwhelmingly up in District 11. So, but I don't think... District is a lot different than the entire state. Uh, I'm aware. I'm just saying that I, I think if you pull all three of those funds that the governor wants to raise, I think you're going to have a large portion that do not support that. If you look over your left shoulder at the graphic that's displayed right above you, and you can see that the uh, bonding bill is referenced at the bottom. Um, what's your reception to the idea of a 1.27 off your bonding bill? Uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, I can tell you uh, we're open to the, the system that we've had in place, which is a smaller, a significantly smaller bonding bill in the budget year and open to a bigger bonding bill in the the non-budget year, that's typically how it's been. Uh, so I, that's where I'm at. Did I hear you, Senator, say the political ground shifted with the election of Senator Rarick? You heard my question earlier about this idea that the top 10 proposals in the House have no chance in the Senate at this point. Is there any truth to that? And do you see any of them that you would favor at this point? Well, right now we're focusing on what we want to do in the Senate. I couldn't even name the top 10 that uh, the House has, but. We're going to look at every issue. We, we're, we're committed to taking a look at every single issue. Um, you know, we'll just have to see how the two chairs of each of the areas come together and what they can agree on. Uh, but our focus right now is on the Senate's agenda, which was reducing the cost of health care, dealing with child care, mental health issues, waste, fraud, and abuse, and tax conformity without raising taxes. That's what we're presenting forward. Uh, the governor uh, raises taxes with his tax conformity. I'm not sure where the House is. We'll have to figure out how we come together. But has the political calculus changed with the election of Senator Rarick? I don't know that it's changed. I think we're tip we've, we've been where we always have been. Uh, the governor and the House will be on another side, and we have to figure out how do we navigate to a finish at the end. That's why I'm, st I'm still optimistic about that, that nothing really has changed with, with how I think we'll be able to work. Um, maybe that we're the, the House or the Senate being 35-32, uh, we're, we don't miss a day because somebody's sick or can't be there. We're able to, to move the agenda more easily. Did I hear you say a question there that, that you guys have pretty much said no to? One is the provider tax chunk of money, and the other is the transfer that is, is made only with a gas tax. Uh, but then he spends those things on, on stuff that people might want. So how do you articulate the fact that he's, he's put this on to you folks, and by saying no to those two tax sources, He's trying to make you be the ones that are saying no to spending that people might be interested in. So the other thing that we have not really addressed or I haven't seen from the governor yet is how do we deal with waste? How do we deal with, with fraud? Uh, there's a number of areas that we know there's fraud and waste. Uh, you know, the daycare fraud issue is an area. Uh, you know, I know, Speaker Dowd, you talk about uh, some of the issues that were passed four years ago. Uh, do we have to do everything the same way we always do it? There's none of that. There's been no discussion there. We believe there's 10% that we, if we really dug deeper, that we could find looking across each agency. But that's where we need some cooperation with the governor, his new commissioners, to dig deeper to look at some of the areas. We, we never do anything that I would call a reform as, as far as dealing with those issues, and we should. Jordan, there, has he taken a, a clever tactical role? He's gone big in the gas tax increase. You came into this saying, we, we want to be at zero. We don't want a gas tax increase. He's going 20 plus tab fees. He can look like he can compromise, and you guys are stuck at zero. How are you going to make this case? I think he's going to be disappointed uh, because it's not something that we're going to just move to the middle on. Uh, how we spend money and where we spend money by area, by for. K-12 or higher ed or HHS, those are some of the issues that uh, we often have to come to a place somewhere between the two positions that we have. Uh, but we are firm on uh, not having a gas tax and not in the sick tax being dead. Seems like the transpo people always want to do planning like 20 years out, which is why they want a more reliable, stable fund. Um, and it seems like general fund money is really subject to, to the economy and the whims of of you know, what happens with the national economy. Yeah, and, and we said last year we, we almost were able to do a constitutional amendment that put it before the people that all of the sales tax on auto parts went to Rosenbridges. I'm still in that position. 
There were, I circled, I, I have my book back there that I circled some things I thought, okay, here's something we can agree on. Uh, but I really wanted to lay out the, the bigger pieces where we're far apart uh, to figure out how we get together. I mean, they're, they're, the issue of broadband, for example, uh, local government aid, I think, is an area that we often talk about, uh, you know, particularly in rural Minnesota. So there's a number of areas that I, we're going to find some agreement, but the spending pieces are very far apart at this point. What's your reaction to the proposals in K through 12 education, which is the single largest budget area in the state? So all of us agree that uh, education funding is very important. Uh, what I want to know is, is are there areas that we are innovating? Uh, for example, uh, racial disparity, uh, particularly inner city, is very far apart. Uh, we've been talking about opportunity scholarships, which isn't a very expensive thing, but allows inner city kids to take different directions than the school that they're in. So I'm looking for what are the areas that we're innovating, not just more money. Are you glad he backed off on universal pre-K? Is that one he backed off on? Versus Dayton. <laughs> he, he can propose whatever he wants. In the end, we got to figure out you know, where, we're gonna, where we're gonna aim to at the end, so that's his call. All right, thank you.